Hello viewers and a very warm welcome. You're watching the brand new edition of To The Point with your host Kriti Mishra. And on today's show, we have a very special guest, one of India's foremost public health experts and president of Public Health Foundation of India, Professor K. Srinath Reddy. Professor Reddy, welcome to Rath Sabha Television and thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Sir, of course, uh, talking about COVID-19, the trajectory of COVID-19 infections in India is a matter of concern. You've said that we oscillated from lockdown to laxity. What are the factors that are responsible for the current surge, sir? Well, it's very clear that the rates of daily case counts, daily death counts, and test positivity rates started plummeting from the end of September and came down to very, very low levels by early January. And at that time, it was somehow perceived that not only had the first wave or the second wave, whatever it was called in different places, ended, but that we were never going to get a surge again. In fact, many people felt rather erroneously that we had put the pandemic behind us. The feeling that we have acquired herd immunity and we were now protected from the virus was a false belief, but it was nurtured even by some public health experts and scientific reports. And people hear what they want to hear because the industry wants to get back to full economic activity to revive the economy which had gone into a slump during the lockdown and the pandemic uh, post -pan uh, lockdown uh, restrictions as well. And uh, the small trader wants to get back to business. And the people want to get back to their lives, meet uh, families, travel, and the politicians want to get back to elections and rallies and so on and so forth, whether it's local bodies or assemblies. So it is written to normal life with a gusto. And therefore, uh, I believe that caution was abandoned. We permitted large gatherings to happen, unrestricted travel to happen, a lot of people meeting, uh, not just for partying, but even for work in closed indoor spaces with very little ventilation. And all of this gives the virus a great opportunity. The virus travels with people and celebrates with the crowds. And we gave it ample opportunity. And it was also joined by its band of variants. Firstly, we had the Kent variant or the British variant, the B117, which came in into Punjab and Delhi and Haryana then we had what's called the double mutant B1617 arising in, uh, or at least recognized for the first time in Maharashtra and then spreading in that region. And now we have a triple mutant B1618, which is now established in West Bengal and possibly spreading to neighboring states. And these have higher rates of infectivity, at least by circumstantial evidence, it appears they are more infective. So both the original virus and the variants have had a super highway to travel without any restrictions. And that has resulted in a huge surge of cases. And now that's what we are battling at the moment. But so the report recently published in The Lancet stated that it could be an airborne pathogen. If we were to assume this, we need a complete overhaul of our strategy. Well, it is true that even last year it was recognized, though emphasis was mostly on droplet infection. And that's where the masks came into play. But even there, if you remember, Chancellor Angela Merkel, even in June, July last year, very clearly said we need good ventilation. She said one of the reasons why Germans are better protected is that they invariably open their doors and windows, at least for part of the day, to ensure ventilation. We knew that well-ventilated spaces are less likely to have viral clouds accumulating. Now there is much better proof that particularly in indoor places which are not very well ventilated, the viruses tend to gather as clouds and drift from room to room. They can actually infect a person who is not in even near proximity but sitting in another room. Now that doesn't mean that the viruses are spreading all over in the air outside. The virus clouds do form. But in outside air where the wind velocity is higher and there are more open spaces, the viruses get dis dispersed. So the clouds do not remain for long, they get dispersed. On the other hand, 
in close spaces or ill ventilated places or when large crowds gather together for a long time, even in an outdoor place, there is enough opportunity for the uh, viral clouds to form and hang around. So the idea of an aerosol spread is, yes, there is a greater danger. You need to protect yourself. You do need to wear a mask, definitely outside the house, indoor or outdoor. Wear inside the house if there is somebody who is infected or who has been exposed to a person who has been infected, then protect yourself by wearing masks even at home. Those are some of the precautions that are being suggested. But or even double mask if you are travelling in an area where you can't have physical distancing, like in a train or a bus or something like that, or in an office, double mask if you can. So those are the precautions being suggested. It doesn't mean that the virus is freely moving through the air throughout the country. It doesn't mean okay. that. Okay. All right, sir. Talking about another important aspect, which is of reinfection. So, what is the current status of evidence from India about how long does immunity last among people who have recovered from the infection? Well, some of the studies that have been done in terms of the antibodies have shown that if you depend only on natural infection as your source of immunity, then you're going to be disappointed because your the amount of viral load that you're exposed to may be very variable. If you have a low viral load, you may be asymptomatic or get a mild infection, but your immunity may disappear within three to six months. That is why in repeat serological surveys that have been done, for example, in Mumbai and elsewhere, what was reported as a very high level of antibody prevalence last year has now re been reduced. So that's because the antibodies disappeared in a few months' time. Of course, there could be some immunity from what is called the cellular immunity, which has not been studied and which is more difficult to study. But nevertheless, the fact is that sir, sir, for the benefit of immunity. our viewers, sir, for the benefit of our viewers, what is cellular immunity, sir? Okay, there are two major components of immunity, which are uh, for an immunity that is produced by an external antigen or an insult that comes through a microbe that invades your body. That's adaptive immunity, which is reacting to some foreign antigen that is threatening you. Now, the first is, of course, what is called the antibody response, which are produced by cells called the B cells. They try and hold the antigen in place till other cells come and capture it and kill it, the killer cells. But there is also the T cell immunity, which both has the cells which can kill the virus, but also cells which store the memory of the virus. They actually store the memory so that they can get activated whenever the virus is encountered again. So they, it's like, you know, putting up the picture of a known criminal at the police station. So suddenly if somebody says that, okay, there is somebody who is here, then you immediately recognize that person and say, okay, this is the criminal and we have to, we can, we know where to find him. So that is the kind of memory that is stored. So basically, these are the two functions, but we know for reasonable, uh, I mean, amount of surety now that the antibodies themselves disappear uh, soon. So we cannot say that a natural infection itself will, uh, will confer lasting immunity beyond a few months. On the other hand, a vaccine does give you much stronger uh, immune response, but also a longer duration of immune response. That is because there is a standardized dose of the vaccine. The antigen is standardized. Therefore, the initial response itself is stronger than the variable antigenic exposure of a natural infection. Secondly, you're getting both a priming dose and a booster dose. If the priming dose puts your immunity into second gear or third gear, your booster dose puts you into the top gear. It really energizes energize your immune system. So therefore, the immunity conferred by a vaccine may last a year or even beyond a year, maybe up to two years. Whereas with a natural infection, you're still at risk after a few months. And that's why everybody who has had a COVID infection is also encouraged very strongly to go ahead and get vaccinated. 
All right, sir. So that was absolutely clear as far as uh, immunity is concerned. But talking about the rising number of cases, now each state will need to tackle the virus differently probably. Some states have reported more than one lakh active cases. What could be the new strategy to battle the surge of COVID cases in the country, which of course, as you said, is promoted by laxity in safety measures and of course, a mutant strain of the coronavirus? Well, the containment strategy is very simple, whether it is the original virus or the variants which have greater infectivity. There are only three portals by which the viruses can enter your body, three gateways. They are the nose, the mouth and the eyes. If you can protect your mouth and nose very well with a proper mask, properly worn, even if necessary double mask, and protect your eyes as well if possible with glasses, then the likelihood of you getting a droplet infection or the likelihood of you getting aerosol infection is greatly reduced. So that is the first thing. Second thing is do not give an opportunity for viral transmission in groups of people by allowing large groups to uh, gather. So having marked restrictions on uh, super spreader events like large rallies and large gatherings for whatever reason is absolutely important. Even travel restrictions are important. Not that you should shut down travel, but keep it only for essential purposes so that again, you do not have too many people crowded together for too long a time. So that is the most important uh, thing to be done if you want to reduce the viral transmission. Then of course, go ahead and vaccinate as many people as possible, partly to protect. In fact, right now the immediate goal is to protect the people from getting severe infection. You may still get mild infection after vaccination. But over a period of time, the transmission rates also will fall down because if people are asymptomatic or get mild infection even after vaccination, they're still not discharging enough a large number of virus particles into the air to cause a danger to others. So over a period of time, even transmission rates will come down with vaccination. So I think we do need to vaccinate also fast. But since that is going to be a bit of a delayed effect, right now the important thing is to maintain discipline and masking, discipline and not crowding and not having super spreader large gatherings. Absolutely. So COVID appropriate behavior is of paramount importance. But so the first wave, the cases we saw peaked in September, almost one lakh every day for weeks, but later it declined. Today, there are more than three lakh cases every day. Is this the peak of the second wave? And when will it begin to decline? Well, we can't really uh, forecast because there are two important considerations. First is, how is the virus behaving? Second is, how are we behaving? Most models have very little clarity on the second one. They only know how the virus is multiplying, how many people is it infecting. I mean, the what's called the R factor. One infected person infects so many others. Even that is an imprecise number because there are so many asymptomatic people who don't get tested. So you really don't have an absolute clue about whether the R number being fully accurate. But nevertheless, it's a good tracker. But you know how the virus is behaving in terms of its infectivity and spread. But you are not able to tell how you are reacting in terms of your containment, in preventing large gatherings, in getting everybody to wear a mask. So those are some of the uncertain elements. I would say that if everybody gets their act together and observes all the COVID appropriate behavior right from policy level restrictions to private conduct, then we should start seeing the cases coming down by mid-May and the deaths coming down by uh, end of May. But that is overall all India number. Uh, there will be regional variations because the calendar of COVID is not the same in every part of India. Some places started early, they will decline a little early. Some places started late, they will decline later. But uh, overall in India, we should see the position improving for case counts by mid-May if we do everything right. All right, if we do everything right, and of course, fingers crossed for itself. But we've been told repeatedly by government, by other leading doctors in the country, that only about 10 to 15 percent of the cases required oxygen therapy in medicines like remdesivir. As high as 85 to 90 percent COVID-19 positives get mild or no symptoms, such as fever, cough, sore throat, 
and needs symptomatic treatment. But how do we drive home this point that patients are not panic is the key to handling the situation? As we are hearing cases of hoarding of remdesivir, oxygen cylinders, oxygen concentrators. Well, let me clarify certain things. First, of course, your point is absolutely right that there is an unnecessary panic rush to hospitals by many people and families where the sickness is of not sort of such an intensity that they need hospitalization or intensive care. But people are so unsure of what will happen. They don't know who is going to sick, so they feel they must go to protect themselves. If we have good home care, even good intermediate care, where they are assured that they are being monitored, even by telemedicine or by advice by primary health care teams, oximetry is actually being uh, uh, used to measure the oxygen levels in the blood frequently and if possible uh, temperature is being measured as well with the help of either family members or by way of uh, primary health care teams and if they are told that you are alright, this is what you need to do, take rest and take this minimal medicines or whatever for fever but if you actually have breathing difficulty or your oxygen levels fall then we know where the emergency transport systems can be arranged and for a good transport to a hospital where you are likely to get a bed and you don't have to run around from hospital to hospital. If those arrangements are streamlined, many people would be happy to stay at home and recover at home. Or other people may have to be transferred to an intermediary care area where only oxygen is needed, apart from pe putting people on the belly, which is called proning, which also improves oxygen, then that may be adequate. Then the rush in the hospitals by everybody with illness of varying severity will not happen. But coming back to the drugs, I am a member of a WHO global uh, expert group, yes, which is actually the executive group of the Solidarity Trial, which has been running the biggest trial on the Indusweed, uh, globally. It's an international trial. And that has not found remdesivir to be useful in saving lives. There is absolutely no benefit in terms of reducing deaths. And the WHO trial did not even find a benefit in reducing the duration of illness. That particular in, in effect of reducing the duration of illness was found in a smaller American trial, which had some issues with it because the two groups Remdesivir group and the control group were imbalanced. The Remdesivir group had less number of people on oxygen and on mechanical ventilation when they were began on their treatment. So, in a sense, it's not a fair comparison between the two groups. So, we cannot clearly and confidently say that even the hospital duration is reduced. But since the Americans are putting it in their treatment protocols, though WHO dropped it from the treatment protocol in uh, November, since the Americans have put it, our doctors are also giving it. I'm not, I, I have some reservations about it, but if the doctors have, in their wisdom, chosen to give it, fine. But to say that everybody needs remdesivir, that it's a life-saving drug, that it's a miracle drug, it can be given in hospitals as well as at home, that is absolutely misleading, and that is what is leading to panic uh, situations, panic buying, black marketing, hoarding. Yes. So I think it's absolutely incumbent upon authorities to tell what the truth is about remdesivir. But sir, given that there is no specific cure for the virus and many therapies are listed as investigational therapies, what is your opinion whether we should have a definitive treatment protocol? Well, we do have, uh, at least in seriously ill patients in hospital, uh, simple steroids like dexamethasone have been shown to be life-saving. The big British trial called recovery has shown that. It has also shown that another drug called toxilizumab has been helpful, but in a very small percentage of cases, not everybody requires it, and it's a fairly toxic drug. It should be reserved only for a small fraction of people. But again, it's being misused widely in practice in India, which is again incorrect. So I think the standard protocols are being produced, particularly by fairly good authorities like the Indian Council of Medical Research, but also there are a number of good internationally validated protocols also in circulation and many doctors are using it. But several other doctors are doing what they want to do because they want to please the patients. They want to throw in as many drugs as possible, as many investigations as possible, which is quite unnecessary. 
True, absolutely. And so talking about vaccination, what is going to be different about phase three as we're in the middle of the new wave? This time we are seeing that the new phase of vaccination drive coincides with the surge in COVID-19 cases, which of course we did not have earlier, and we also saw vaccine hesitancy to a certain extent. Well, I think the vaccine hesitancy is yielding place now because vaccine hesitancy was there when people had doubts about the efficacy of the vaccine, but also did not feel the threat. The threat perception was very low. Now everybody is feeling threatened. Everybody is feeling worried. Yes. So I think the acceptance of the vaccine has remarkably gone up now. Now it's for us to get the systems in place so that the people who are wanting to get vaccinated are assisted in getting vaccinated. And some of the vulnerable groups who may not have access to vaccine information are provided that information. Like, for example, some of the poorer families and the migrant families may not have smartphones to register. Now, you don't have walk-in clinics. So yes. you need primary health care services or community volunteer groups to help them to get registered, assist them in getting vaccinated. So some of these things need to be done also, not just leaving it to a smartphone uh, to get people. Absolutely, sir. And lastly, given the Indian experience, what have we contributed to the global pool of knowledge on the virus treatment and protocol? Well, I think last year we contributed the knowledge on what to do, how to effectively handle the pandemic with a, what I call a coordinated countrywide containment. And we acted rationally and behaved appropriately. And greatly uh, contained the potential damage of uh, cases and deaths. Uh, and we also showed how the federal government and the states could work together in unison, in a spirit of true collaboration, uh, to address a public health emergency in a united fashion. Uh, some things have slipped up this time. I think our caution was thrown to the winds, and we didn't anticipate the second wave. And the lesson, therefore, is don't take things for granted. Don't think that this virus is so benign that it goes away the moment you turn your back on it. It's not going to turn its back on you. So you better be careful and continue to maintain the vigil. And even if your second wave ends soon enough, you are worried about a third wave later on. But even if the third wave doesn't come, there can be the first wave of another virus. Strengthen your health systems, get your systems in place. As they say in the army, keep your powder dry so that if there's an emergency, be ready to react efficiently and fast with your health systems fully strengthened and available on short notice. That, of course, open, uh, opens up uh, the avenue for private investment in health, sir, greatly. Well, private sector has been investing in health, but mostly in upper and tertiary care hospitals. Our major concern has been in secondary care, where even oxygen is not available. We need to strengthen our district hospitals and secondary care hospitals. We need to strengthen primary health care, especially urban primary health care. How many people are getting home care assistance now? How many people are being detected early enough with their symptoms to be assisted for testing? So all of these are issues which are related to urban primary care. That's why the 15th Finance Commission in its report said that urban primary health care systems must be strengthened. That's a good recommendation. They also said money will go to municipal bodies, which is also a good recommendation, local bodies. So we need to strengthen our, all layers of our health system, but first and foremost pay a lot of attention to primary care, especially urban primary health care, which has been grossly neglected and the pandemic in most places found it in shambles. All right, sir. Thank you so much for talking to us, and thank you so much for this insightful interview. I'm sure the viewers are going to find it very, very useful. And of course, the biggest point that we need to drive home is that we have to follow the COVID-appropriate behavior. On that note, Professor Reddy, thank you so much for speaking to Radzatwa Television. Most welcome. Bye. Thank you, sir.